Well, good morning to you. Last week we started a look at what it means to obey God. We looked at what is involved in obeying God, at the fact that it takes uh, challenges sometimes to obey God. We looked at the fact that it takes courage to obey God. We looked at Daniel and his companions in Daniel chapter 1 and what all went into uh, to their decision to obey God and not Nebuchadnezzar. Well, obeying God isn't always easy. Sometimes it takes lessons, some hard lessons. And so today we're going to look at the learning process of obeying God, waiting on God in prayer, meditating on God's Word, and uh, other things that go into waiting on and learning how to obey God. It's going to be a good one. Stay tuned. And as Bill Cosby used to say, if you're not careful, you might just learn something. Trust and When we get to making decisions, especially really important ones, what kinds of questions do you ask yourself before you make a decision, before you make uh, your conclusion? Do you, do you ask yourself things like, well, what, what would this profit me in this situation? Or do you ask yourself, uh, what would people think? What would my neighbor think? What benefit? am I going to get from this particular uh, selection that I make, from this decision that I'm about to make? Well, last week we looked at obeying God and what goes into it. We looked at, for instance, commands that God gives us. You can't get around the fact. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He told the apostles, uh, as he gave the great commission, to go into all the world and teach them whatsoever things I have commanded you. And then there's challenges. We're going to have challenges at times, even sometimes as we'll see in a little bit from our own brethren, that they're not going to like it when we make a decision that goes with what God wants us to do. And then we've got to make a commitment. We looked at that last week, the commitment that we have to have that, okay, I'm a Christian, I'm going to follow what God says, and then courage. I should have put the picture back up here of that uh, uh, young man in Tiananmen Square staring down the tanks from that uprising they had several years ago. Now, if we look at our text, turn over to Hebrews chapter 5. It, it could look like this text uh, is telling us Jesus learned obedience through trial and error. But what we have to remember is, just before the writer uh, uh, made these remarks in Hebrews 5, he said in Hebrews chapter 4 that Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are, but was without sin. So we, we can't say, well, Jesus doesn't know what it's like. Oh, Jesus, you just have no idea when, when we're there on Judgment Day. Because he was tempted, just like I am, just like you are. He had to deal with all those same temptations. Look at our text. Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience, watch this, by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Many times it is because of going through a situation that gives us an understanding. For instance, how many of us have driven by the scene of an accident? Maybe a real serious one, but we just drive on by. But as one writer said as I was uh, preparing for this lesson, one writer said, I read a lot about accidents, I saw a lot, but it was only after I was involved in one that almost took my life that I realized how horrible they can be. And that's the way it is that Jesus went through. That's what he went through. He came to earth and lived like us. Lived among us. 
There's even a book by that title called Who Walked Among Us. And he uh, lived among us and faced the same types of temptations that we do. Tempted in all ways, yet was without sin. So you're not going to be able to say, well, Jesus, you don't know what it was like to have to fight off that temptation to, uh, to, to uh, be drunk or gluttony or that temptation to uh, stay away from porn. Whatever you had to deal with, Jesus had to deal with. You felt hunger? Jesus felt hunger. Temptation. He was tempted to not obey God. What about the night before he uh, went to the cross? Father, if, it is, if there's some way I can get out of this, let it happen. But nonetheless, not my will but yours be done. That's the kind of high priest we need. That's the kind of Savior we need. Someone who can say, hey, I know. I lived as a human being. I went through the same things you went through. I was tempted just like you are tempted. Jesus was tempted and tried, but through all that, he learned obedience. Remember again, Gethsemane. He learned through the sufferings just like we do. He was a son, but he learned obedience through what he suffered. It wasn't trial and error. He learned what it was like to be a human by coming here and living as a human, have a look, Romans 5. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, but also by one man's obedience, many became righteous. Philippians 2. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Living a humble human life, he learned what it meant to, be, uh, to obey. He learned what it was like to be a human. He was totally successful in resisting temptation. Remember, too, when you look at uh, the accounts in the gospel about Jesus being tempted by Satan, it ends by saying Satan left him for a time, or I think one says until a more opportune time. That wasn't the only time Satan tempted him. Arguably, the biggest temptation he had was the night that uh, he was arrested. And he had to pray to God to let this cup pass from my hand, but if it can't, not my will but yours be done. Jesus' obedience and his suffering that he chose, that made him perfect. It helped to prepare the way. He fulfilled uh, all the law, and he learned to obey. And today I want us to look at the learning process that goes into obeying God. We started last week looking at uh, what it means to obey God, what, uh, what's involved. What's the learning process? How do I learn to obey God? First of all, we have to wait in prayer. Waiting in prayer. Boy, sometimes we just want the answer right away, don't we? But many times we don't get that answer right away. Maybe God needs to get our attention in a particular area. Or he's going to make us, make us wait. Have you noticed even today at so-called fast food restaurants, you still have to wait? You go in. It used to be when I worked at McDonald's way back in the dark ages, um, that we had these, these uh, little bins that we would put the, make the burgers or whatever, put them in there, and they were kept warm. We had, I think it was 10 minutes or 15 minutes. If they weren't sold, we had to pull them and make fresh ones. But today, you have to wait for it, even at McDonald's while they, while they make it. I don't want to wait. I want to grab it and go. But sometimes with God, I've got to wait when He uh, wants me to get an answer to my prayers. Maybe He's needing me to grow up. Maybe He's needing me to uh, uh, learn some other kind of a lesson before uh, He can give me an answer. There are going to be times He just wants us to wait. Be patient. And we also have to remember that maybe he's trying to get us to build faith. And we just have to be patient and endure it. Something I have to teach my kid a lot. If she wants to do something right now, Dad, I say, got to wait. You know, we're about to have supper, so you're going to have to wait till after supper or whatever's going on. Sometimes he's trying to build patience. Sometimes God wants us to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, build up faith. And if there's one thing that's worse than waiting for God, to answer a prayer, it's wishing you had waited. How many of us have jumped the gun and just made a, a decision in haste? Well, I've got this good investment. I don't want it to get away, so I'm going to put my money into it, and boom, there goes your money. You've just lost it. How many people do we know that have maybe uh, uh, gotten married to someone really fast, and then later on we're wondering, why did I do that? Isaiah 55, verse 9 says, As the heavens are higher than your ways, or higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. There will be times maybe a particular direction that we're going in seems the right thing to do. Maybe we think, oh yeah, this is really uh, a surefire winter, but God's views, uh, no, that's not a good idea. And I'm going to show you a couple of those here in just a little bit. Uh, because not only do we have to uh, wait in prayer on God, but we have to 
uh, have daily meditation on God's Word if we're going to learn to obey God. Because we cannot walk obediently before God if we are not in God's Word, if we are not reading it every day. If you don't get into God's Word every day, I can tell you from personal experience, that's when indifference sets in. That's when I become less concerned about what God wants me to do and what God thinks about the life in general, and I'm more concerned about other people. Maybe I don't even care what they think even. You've probably seen this, that seven days without prayer makes one week. And notice how weak it's spelled. Or, without God, seven days makes one week. And again, notice how weak it's spelled. You can say the same thing about seven days without being in God's Word. It's going to make you weak. It's going to trip you up spiritually. And what does God's Word have to say about meditating on it? Now, I asked this question in the, uh, in the Bible class. What do you think of when you hear meditation? Someone sitting with their legs crossed. I'm too stiff and can't do it that way. But, you know, someone, their legs crossed, they're sitting there, um, um, is that what you think of? Well, let's see what, how God's Word defines it. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, he told Joshua, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your uh, then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. So what does he mean when he talks about meditating? Well, there's three three things we should do. One is you notice to keep talking about it. He said, "This shall not depart from your mouth." The word shall not depart. No, talk about it. Don't don't let your 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 talk slip into other things. We like to talk about what's important to us. How many of us uh, soon will be talking about Alabama-Auburn football? Well, that's important to us. We like that. What about God's Word? Then he says to uh, meditate on it. So keep thinking about it. When I'm not here, when I'm, when I'm on the job, what am I thinking about as I'm going down the road in the car? Maybe as I'm wandering the aisles at Walmart. And then he said keep doing it, to observe it, put it into practice, to use it. Later on, the psalmist is going to tell us something similar. He's going to say, how can a young man cleanse his way? And he, and he answers the question right there. By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's not this pump in the chest, but it, it's in his mind. He's got it locked in so that uh, he won't sin against God. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. Now think about this. If I want to teach children to be obedient to God, the Bible's got to be a part of it. Because if I want my child to grow up to be a Christian, and that should be our goal, how am I going to do that if I don't have her in the Word? Now she's going to be four next month. She's already got one scripture memorized. We're working on, on some more. That's what's going to help to keep her uh, in the Word, to keep the Bible as part of her training. Sure, if she wants to grow up and play sports, that's great. She wants to be homecoming queen, that's great. But none of that is going to get her into heaven. And a lot of times, parents, I've noticed, get the wrong emphasis. They want their kid to be, uh, to be the star quarterback or to, or to be the homecoming queen. They don't stop to think, how am I going to get my kid to heaven? That should be the ultimate goal of getting your kid to heaven with all my heart. Notice he says he's going to reflect with all his heart. That's my intellectual capacities. That's going to keep myself right before God. That's how I'm going to keep obedient to God is to keep it in my head, to think about it, process it, find ways to use it, to apply it. And then also the phrase he says, I will, I will meditate. This is where I'm saying I'm going, to, I'm going to study. I'm going to learn all I can from it. I'm not just going to read it once a week when I'm down here or twice a week when I'm down here uh, at the church building, and I'm not just going to kind of uh, flip through it and fly through it as I'm reading. I'm going to take my time to read it. Okay, what does he mean by this? Now, here's a word here I'm not sure, but I need to look it up. How, how am I going to use this? How am I going to uh, change my life to conform to what the Word of God says? Not look for, a, okay, I, I want to uh, live a life, my life a certain way. I'm going to find something here in the Bible to justify it. And then the Word of God is meant to be our counselor. Where do you go to for counsel? If you want good advice and when you're making a decision, let's start with the Scriptures. Now, you may not find the exact answer to your question. I've got two different job offers here. i got one here from Walmart and, and uh, one here from, uh, from uh, Fred's or from Target. Which one do I take? You're not going to find a Scripture that says go to work for Walmart. 
But there might be something in the job offer that you've got that if you look at the scriptures, there's something in there that might provide you some kind of guidance as to just generally what to look for. And God's word is how we get wisdom. This is how we learn to be uh, obedient to God. It's okay to seek counsel of others. It's okay to ask advice, but ask from someone who is obedient to God. I can't get godly counsel if I go to my neighbor who's not a Christian. If I want my child to grow up and be committed to the Lord, then I've got to uh, show her the example and set the proper uh, the proper path. How many parents uh, do, when uh, do, do how many parents read the Bibles to their kids at home, or start out using that as a reader? Just like with your homework, you expect your kids to study their math, their science, whatever uh, subjects they've got. Why don't we do the same thing with the Bible? Had a, we preached uh, in a place one time where. I counted up about 60, I think it was 62% of the uh, teens and adults never brought a Bible with them. And the thing that really got me was how it bothered them that whenever I brought it up. And I even had a parent who called me one day and said, well, my, I don't have to make sure my kid takes uh, their math class to school because the math book's already there. So why do they have to bring a Bible? I said, well, okay, that's true. The, math, the science book is already at school. But when they go to the science class, do they have their science book with them? When they go to history, do they have their history book and all their materials for history? Yeah, they do. So when you come to church, what do you need? You need all your materials for church. You need your Bible. If for some reason you forget it, you don't have it, yeah, we've got few Bibles here, but they don't do you any good if they're just sitting on the pew. you got to still have to pick it up and open it and read it. The Bible that you have at home, you still have to pick it up, open it, and read it. Even if you've got it on an app on your phone, you still have to open up the app and read it. It's not going to do any good just sitting on your phone and you never touch it. The Bible doesn't do anyone any good unless you get into it. You cannot learn your science at school unless you get into your science book or learn your history or whatever the subject is. You've got to study the material. And that's the way with God's Word is you've got to study the material. Meditate on the Word, wait in prayer, and then sometimes when God wants us to do something, the way is not always going to be clear. Now yesterday morning when I got up, I walked over here uh, from our apartment to uh, to do some preparation for today. It was foggy yesterday morning. It was about 5.30, 6 o'clock. It was foggy. From our apartment, I couldn't even see this intersection down here. And then when I got down here, I still couldn't really see the church building very clear. It wasn't clear. Sometimes when God wants us to do something, the way is not always going to be clear. Sometimes faith requires just stepping out into the unknown. I had some friends once that uh, this was years ago when I was still in Alaska, and they moved up there just on faith. They decided that's where they thought they needed to be and moved on up. No jobs, no really anything, but they eventually did uh, both get jobs, and it worked out pretty well for them. They just stepped out into the unknown. Now, there are also some Bible people who had to do the same thing, even though it made no sense what God was telling them. True faith takes courage to step out and do it. And there are going to be times maybe something uh, that you're thinking about doing makes no sense from a human standpoint. Let me just give you two examples. One is Abraham. I'd love to have been a fly on the wall for that conversation when Abraham came home to his wife. Hey, uh, Sarah, we're going to pack up and move. Oh, really? Why? Well, God told me to. Uh-huh. And where did God say we're going to move to? Well, he didn't. He just said to pack up and go, and when we get there, he'll tell us. Mm -hmm. Okay, ladies, if your husband came home and said that's what we're going to do, how many of you would say, all right, let's start packing? But they did, and they obeyed God, and you can see what happened. Then what about Gideon? From a human standpoint, it made no sense to whittle his army all the way down to 300 men. In American military terms, that's a couple of infantry companies. It's not a lot. doesn't make any sense. You want me to do what? Send more of them home? But wait a minute. We've already made one cut. Here's the second one. You, you know, now I've only got 300 men. You sure? What? Huh? And you can think of others. Joshua, what do you mean just march around the city seven times? But it didn't make any sense. But this is where stepping out on faith comes in. This is where... Uh, they were. Uh, met, they had. They, they knew God's word. They knew God, and then they also had to deal with conflict. Because if you're going to obey God, conflict's going to come along. 
may not always be like what uh, this picture illustrates, but you are going to get conflict from people who don't understand or respect God's Word. Hey, come on, let's go play golf. I got a tea time Sunday morning. What time? Nine o'clock. I can't do that. I got I to gotta be at, at Sunday school. I got to be at church. Why? What do you mean? What are you talking about? Can't you just take one Sunday off? Hey, we got a, the family reunion. Uh, we're, we're having a big lunch on, on Sunday at 11, and, and it's going to be two hours away. No, I, I've got to find a way to work in. Either if I can't be at my home church, I've got to find a place out there somewhere where I can go. They're not going to understand it. <coughs> and sometimes even our own brethren aren't going to get it. Sometimes even Christians are going to cause conflict. How many of us know Christians who don't see any problem with skipping out on church for uh, various things, to go play golf, to go fish, to do whatever? And they come up with all kinds of ways to justify it and rationalize it. But it will. I've even known of Christians who encourage other Christians to sue Christians, to lie, to do all kinds of other clearly unethical things. And then there's also the fact that uh, conflict comes from within and without of the fold. You can't always expect Christians are going to do the right thing or encourage you to do the right thing. Some of them are going to get in the way. So we talked a little bit about that in the uh, Bible class this morning. But that's it's just a fact of life. That even Christians sometimes aren't going to want to uh, obey God or do what God uh, uh, says for us to do. The world, remember, is the kingdom of darkness. We're the kingdom of light. And I want you to notice... Where's my pointer? I want you to notice here where he tell, says to fight the good fight. And then down here, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Will suffer persecution. Fight the good fight. Does that sound like Christianity is always going to be easy? There's going to come conflict. There's going to be challenges. And when we try to obey God and do what is right according to what God says, and then to obey God means we have to learn to obey earthly authority. When I say obey earthly authority, I'm talking about legitimate, lawful authority. I'm not talking about authority that wants us to uh, violate our principles, violate scriptures, or uh, uh, cause us to disobey God. Remember, like Peter said, Acts chapter 4, we would obey God rather than men. We cannot be obedient to God, though, if we're going to spurn earthly authority. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to argue with the boss about, about my shift, and I'm not going to come in. I'm not going to do what they want me to do at work. I'm going to argue with this policeman who just stopped me. I'm going to just argue and fuss and create all kinds of of issues for authority. What kind of example is that setting for our kids? Because then you want your kids to obey you, but Daddy, you don't do, uh, didn't do what the boss said to do. Daddy, I don't see you doing what the Bible says to do. Then what do you? What's your answer going to be to that? Children, yeah, they're to obey their parents. They're they're to obey uh, the, obey God by they learn that by obeying their parents. Sure, but remember, parents, we've got to set the right example. The story is told of a couple of paddle boats leaving Memphis, headed down to New Orleans on the Mississippi. And as they're traveling side by side, the sailors start uh, and the crew start trash talking each other back and forth. They start making challenges. So now the race is on. One boat starts to fall behind. They run out of coal. So they just start throwing their cargo and busting up uh, furniture and things they can to keep burning, keep burning. They ended up winning the race. But to do so, what did they have to do? They had to destroy the cargo that they had. And that, uh, that led to, uh, to us thinking now about the cargo we have. Think of the people that are in our lives, our children. Many times we might get to heaven, but are we going to make sure that our children get to heaven? God gives that authority to us to lead the uh, household and to manage our children to us as parents. God has entrusted them to us as a cargo, just like the cargo on that ship was. Our spouses, our friends. Our job is to get them to their destination, which should be heaven. <laughs> But when uh, uh, my selfish ways, my selfish ambitions take the priority over that, when working and, and church programs or business programs take priority over that, where I'm leaving my family behind, something's not right. Many people start living a compromised life just because they've misplaced priorities. Got to keep the priorities right. Priority for my kid is making sure she gets to heaven. Husband, now I've stopped preaching and started meddling here, but... The husband is to be the head of the house. That's what the Bible says. That's just, just the way it is. Now, husbands, if they're going to be smart and wise, are going to consult their wives. And, and if their kids are old enough, consult them before making big decisions. But that's where the final, the buck stops here, as uh, Harry Truman uh, once said. And then let's remember to obey the civil government. 
even though we may not disagree with the president, we may not like him, uh, may not like his policies, he's still the president. The governor is still the governor. And we, if we can't obey the authority that has been ordained by God, if I can't work within that framework, how am I going to expect my kid to do it? How am I going to expect her to uh, respect my authority as the head, as her parent? How am I going to re- uh, expect her uh, to respect God's authority if I'm not reflecting that to her? Because in every aspect of our lives, we are subject to some other authority. No, I'm not. I own the business. Oh, yeah? Do you have a lease with that office of yours? Oh, yeah. Well, wait a minute. I own the building. Okay. Do you have a mortgage on it? You're subject to the bank. I own it free and clear. Okay. What about the zoning laws and the local ordinances that govern your business? What about the regulation of the state or the federal government, like working in insurance or financial services? There's always going to be someone that you're subject to. So in every aspect of our lives, we are subject to some kind of authority, so I have to show the proper example to my daughter if I expect her to obey God, if I expect her to grow up and to uh, be a Christian one day. And then learning to obey God also means we have to leave the consequences of it to God. Consequences are good or bad. We always think of them or tend to think of them anyway as as being negative. Well, you better clean your room or there's going to be consequences. Well, that's negative. But if he goes and cleans his room, okay, we get to go out for ice cream. That's a consequence. It's a positive one, but it's still a consequence. But some people obey God as long as it's not going to result in any problems for them. But let's go back to looking at last week where you said there'd be challenges. And there's going to be conflict sometimes. Life is not going to be problem free. So we have to uh, factor that in. We are going to have problems, and there are going to be times when it's not easy to obey God. Do you remember last week we looked at Daniel? He did what was right in God's eyes. Yeah, it was a little tough there with the whole food situation. And later on, the uh, furnace is going to create some issues. But we can't ask ourselves, okay, if I obey God here, what if such and such happens? We have to let God handle that fallout. And it may not be easy. Sometimes jobs are on the line. Sometimes there's other issues. But we need to obey God just like Paul did. He endured all kinds of physical attacks and, and uh, people debating with him, arguing with him, slander, libel. But he obeyed God. We need to have that, keep that security with God by obeying God. And then let's remember that learning obedience is going to uh, require divine chastisement. In other words, discipline from God. And remember, discipline is not... Uh, equal to punishment. The Lord disciplines those whom He loves. He instructs. That's really what discipline means. It means to instruct or to teach. And when it comes to God, He's going to uh, instruct. He is going to teach. Now we can uh, look at uh, chastisement from God and deal with it in a couple of different ways. One is, we can look at it as just getting over it. Just something to be struggled through with defiance, shaking our fist at God. Or we can do it with self-pity. I'm the only one who's ever gone through this. But remember, Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are, but was without sin. And the Romans had another way of looking at it. They saw any kind of calamity as punishment from the various gods. We can look at it that way. It's just vengeance that God has given me. Or we can look at it as coming from a loving father. A father who wants to uh, do what's best for us, wants to steer us in the right direction, who wants what's best for us and sometimes needs to show us uh, by maybe getting our attention in a way that we don't particularly care for. And that's the way sometimes uh, uh, with a, with our children sometimes we have to do the same thing. And obeying God is going to be a process that we continue to do throughout our lives. We're not always going to get it down completely. Always going to be something new to learn. Always going to be uh, something that God is going to have in store for us. And if you choose not to obey God, well, that's your decision. You know, the, the only people who go to heaven are going to be volunteers. You just have to be prepared for those consequences if you choose not to obey God. And if you choose to obey God, well, hey, there's still consequences. But they're a lot more positive than the consequences for not obeying God. So this morning, have you, are you obeying God? Are you living a life where you're walking in His light? A life where you've been baptized into Christ and raised to walk in that newness of life with your, your past sins forgiven. You've got to make that decision on your own as you learn to obey God. And if there's anything that's keeping you from obeying God and you want us to help, 
we'll be glad to do that. Pray for you or, or whatever it is that you need. And if we can help you, let us know as together we stand and as we sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus falling tenderly.